of these words. Um, can you hear me in the back? Okay. <coughs> um, thank you for asking me to come here. If anybody's an elephant in the room, it'll probably be me. <coughs> I was here two years ago, and I sat here listening to a lot of stories and a lot of your big brains. Um, we were then talking a lot about stories and about what storytelling can do in health promotion and in, especially in vaccine hesitation. And I was sitting there being exactly where you're sitting, <laughs> being very frustrated and thinking, we're missing out on something. So I spent the last two years in trying to find a project to prove to these brains that stories move and stories have an effect. So I'm going to tell you and run you briefly through my last uh, research. I forgot the thing. <laughs> Sorry. Important slides. Um, we all know that stories kill. Uh, I only have to show you this picture and we have to t say the word autism and we know what stories do. Uh, one single story has become a weapon of mass narration in the case of measles um, vaccinations. Um, but stories can also change. This is Albert. Albert and I, um, we train together in the same gym in Holland. Um, we meet each other about once a week and we just talk. It was last January when Albert and I were alone in the gym and I said to him, there is an advantage to this flu epidemic. It's only us two that have been vaccinated that are in the gym. And he said, no, that's not true. I haven't been vaccinated. I said, what? You're recently retired. In Holland, we all get a flu jab for free. Why not? <coughs> and he said, well, frankly, I just couldn't be bothered. And he said, I never get the flu, so why should I get a jab? And he said, uh, and you also hear these funny things. So I was joking to him about being 68 and getting autism. Um, and I said to him, but Albert, tell me, how are you getting along now? You're freshly retired and you don't no longer have your big, uh, very successful practice. And he said, well, you know, I'm still trying to find my feet. Um, I have a little granddaughter that comes once a week, Rose. She's only six months old. And my parents uh, are still very, very old, so I'm caring for them. So I said, you're a very brave man, Albert, not to be vaccinated with so many vulnerable people around you. Uh, a week later, we were in the gym and it was getting more crowded. And he came up to me and he said, Suzanne, my wife and I have a discussion every year about a flu jab but we went to get one this week, and that is only due to the story. I never realized how I put other people at danger by not having that flu jab. This is a story that changed, and that story is going to travel all the way through Albert's network, wherever he goes. If a word flu jab is mentioned, he's going to mention that word. Now, if stories can change, and stories can kill, then stories can also cure. This is me last January in Nigeria. Um, this is the story that I needed to tell you to make sure that you would understand with your learned brains how stories can change and actually cure, and you can use it. Um, I went um, to this province in Nigeria, Northwest Nigeria. There's only one NGO working there. That's uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. They gave me um, a sapling nursery fund. They had the guts to try this system out, which I've been working on for 20 years in the Western world. Um, it is a very, very remote area. We called the project the MSF Story of Change. Um, in Sokoto, it has, that has the highest prevalence of Noma disease. It's, it's a non-communicable disease. There is a children's hospital there run by MSF together with the Ministry of Health. 
Um, and my aim was to try and get as many little children in on time to get this, uh, them in for treatment. This non-communicable disease is disgusting. It looks really awful. It kills 90% of the children under five. If we get them on time, we can save 90% of the children. So you can imagine the urgency to get kiddies in as soon as possible. Um, four times a year, doctors from all over the world go to this hospital to, in their own expense, and they operate on these children. Um, this is January when I, um, when I went in there. Oh, this is the disease, by the way. I didn't pick out the worst pictures, but it's quite horrible. Um, I went with um, three health promoters and their pilot into the field. We were visiting remote uh, villages, and I looked and watched how they presented their case to the villagers. They stood up. They had a poster, they had leaflets, and they were lecturing to the population. We went back to the, uh, to the hospital and I taught them how to listen to stories, elicit, evoke stories with the uh, community members. So I taught them how to sit down, give them the time, and g get the right words. I, I went with an interpreter who I had simultaneously translate everything that was told. We then went back to the hospital and I transcribed all the stories. I had 50 stories, traditional healers, imams, village elders, uh, mothers, fathers, carers. Um, and those 50 stories we looked at to see if there were repeating patterns. We knew a few things, what they called the disease, how they responded to diseases, what their beliefs and hopes and wishes were, the spirits, um, and how we could support them in this quest to try and get them to diagnose as soon as possible and come to the hospital. Um, I then went back into the villages with this knowledge and I co-created a story of change. I had to do this with two groups because it's a very Islamic, uh, very traditional um, uh, society. So we had a male and a female group. I set them down and I asked them if the story, this by the way is the area, if we have to tell a story uh, about Noma, what would that story be? Who would be the hero in the story? And they quickly came up with a young boy called Abu Bakr, and this sounds really weird, but I had two groups in two completely different areas, male, female, they came up with exactly the same story. So we had this little boy under five, he contracted Noma, and a midwife recognized it. So she went up and told the mother that she should, the child should, she should wash its mouth with salt. Anyway, I'm not going to repeat the story because it's going to take too long, but I have got it with me. So we had now two, two, two co-created stories. We had the 50 stories out of all the communities that we interviewed, and we had the official story by MSF saying, you have to come to the hospital soon, this is what you have to do, we have to so many patients, and all those together, we put them together into the story of Abu Bakr. We then went back into the, uh, the community with the health promoters, different communities, and the health promoters started to talk, to tell the story. What they did is they brought mats, they no longer stood up, they sat down, so at the same eye level as the people there, and they, um, they narrated, first they listened to the stories that people told them, and then told the story of Abu Bakr, with the words that they heard in that specific community. Now, that story is traveling, and that story is actually saving lives. Because after I'd been away, I measured, and if you want to know how, you have to ask me later, we're still measuring every month what that story does. If it's being told, if the community participates, if the stories go around, 
The only rotten thing is that I can't check um, where the stories go to other villages because stories are just like diseases. They're infectious, they're contagious, they go viral, and they cause epidemics. And I want them to cause an epidemic with Abu Bakr. So, this is very briefly how I measure it. Once a month, my interpreter, who's very well trained by me, goes into the villages with the health promoters and an anthropologist who has no uh, uh, judgment. Anthropologists can listen and look. He's my observer, he's my eyes. He comes back and uh, answers my questions and I have the stories recorded that the health promoters tell. And those stories I measure every month on the messages that we put into the story. And now you see that in the course of three months, the story is, become, is developing, but it's still the same story. But it becomes more and more the story of the community and the health worker together. They're composing the story together, and that's what changes people. Um, after three months of doing this, we had 10% more identified patients. We had 10% more patients in the hospital, coming to the hospital. And I can track that back to the story of Abu Bakr and the interaction between the communities. And I'm very, very pleased to tell you that a week ago I got news that after six months, and don't forget I was there in January, yeah, we're in September, Another 10% increase is shown in both self-diagnosis and in the, uh, in the treatment, the number of people coming in for treatment. Can you imagine what this simple, anybody can do it method could do with a vaccine hesitation? So I'm really interested to know what you see as the next step. We could take this to any disease, to any country and to anywhere you want to go because there's a culture of telling stories and they change lives, they save lives. Thank you.